We've just talked about who we are as CrossFit football. Now let's talk about what CrossFit football is. We'll start with a pyramid here because it's the most stable geometric shape. can show you why we put our program together the way that we do. And the way that it starts is with a giant broad foundation. Everything above it will come back down to this. So on our broad foundation, we're going to put nutrition and recovery. Nutrition and recovery is the foundation to what we do as a program because it can all come back to that. If all three components that I list aren't there, then we aren't recovering as properly as we should. The first component is going to be sleep. How many people in here got 12 hours of sleep last night? Raise your hands. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, oh no. You have an athlete walk into your facility and ask for programming, nutritional guidelines, use of your facility, use of your equipment, camaraderie, coaching, everything. It is well within your right to turn right back around and ask them to do something. Can you get eight hours of sleep? Just ask them to it. This is their responsibility. This is 100% on them. Eight hours of sleep minimum, get it. If it comes back to a question of, hey, I work better on six hours of sleep, I feel a little bit more refreshed on seven hours of sleep, come back to this little phrase right here, empowering your performance. Everything that we do throughout this whole pyramid is gonna come back to empowering your performance. It's a performance issue. You get a bigger window of opportunity of healing if you sleep eight hours or more. Get into a cold, dark room, get rid of LED distractions, get rid of electronic distractions, get eight hours of sleep. That's it. Task that to your athletes and you've got that little nugget tucked away. The next is gonna be pre and post workout habits. This is 100% on you, the coach. Pre-workouts are going to be warm-ups, both general and specific. General warm-ups, everybody's seen. Jog a little bit, increase your heart rate, go through some joint mobilities, get your joints loosened up and ready to go, then get directly into a very specific warm-up. Throughout this weekend, we're going to take you to, through multiple warm-up practicals. These are designed to be very specific in central nervous system arousal and musculoskeletal preparedness for the day's training. Okay? This responsibility on you, the coach, shows an investment in your athlete for that day's training. Being as specific as we can to what we want to do that day allows them to empower their performance for today's training. Post-workout. Cool down. Some people call it the middle child. Everyone forgets about it. Thank you, Tony Fu, for that. Post-workout cool-downs. This is where I like to get into my infomercial stage. For only four minutes a day, you can increase your central nervous system recovery by four hours. Well, that sounds fantastic. I want more. If you guys take your athletes through a very calm, very low-key, very specific cool-down, what you do is you increase that recovery window by four hours. Okay, it gives them four extra hours of recovery because you are desensitizing the central nervous system. You are elongating all of the muscle fibers that we have spent the last hour and a half destroying back to an active range of motion. This post-workout pays dividends and empowers your performance. Give it to them. The last four minutes of class, make sure it's scheduled. Make sure that you are on point with your pre and post-workout habits. The third one is going to be shared responsibility of nutrition. This is knowledge. And how it is shared between you and your athlete. Sleep is all on them. Pre and post workout habits are all on you, the coach. This right here is going to be a shared responsibility. When we give you the knowledge, you give the knowledge to your athlete. Ignorance is no longer acceptable, okay? If you don't know, your athletes don't know, and then their performance suffers. <sighs> Nutrition is the easiest thing that we can change. The easiest thing that we can have a factor on, and the greatest performance initiative that we can put 
with all of these athletes, okay? The most significant factor to increasing performance is going to come in the shared knowledge and the nutrition that you give them. You can't out-train a shitty diet. We tried, okay? The analogy of using a diesel fuel and a Napa Auto Parts in order to service and fuel your Lamborghini, it's exactly what you're doing by putting a shitty diet into your athlete. Nutrition and recovery are bigger than what your athlete knows, and you need to educate them accordingly. Where all three of these meet in this beautiful Venn diagram would be this area right through here. This right here is recovery. If all of these are dialed in, your window of recovery gets bigger and bigger. If you lack in pre and post workout sleep or nutrition, it will shift and that window will close down. That's the beauty of the Venn diagram. And no presentation is complete without one of these bad boys. So here it is. There you go. Pie charts, bar graphs, Venn diagram. Uh, got it. The next level, we're going to move into strength and conditioning, barbell and holding, and body awareness. So our first one, strength and conditioning. What is strength and conditioning? How many people in here think that they are a strength and conditioning coach? Okay. People come to your gym, they want to get stronger, they want to get in better shape. So you're a strength and conditioning coach. Lots of people here are going to be in charge of high school or collegiate athletes. A lot of people in here are going to be in charge of general population, or they want to move a little bit closer towards coaching athletes. That's why you're here. Okay. Considering yourself a strength and conditioning coach first and foremost is a way to look at things. Okay. Is CrossFit a strength and conditioning program? Raising hands. Mm. Yes and no? Okay. Does doing CrossFit get you stronger and get you in better shape? Yes. Look at how it does it. So in CrossFit, we have constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. Constantly varied functional movements at high intensity. Doing this will increase your work capacity over broad times and modal domains. This means that I can do a whole bunch of things for a long period of time if needed. I have to be prepared to compete with Fran and Murph and everything in between. It's a very broad, very generalized strength and conditioning program, but a strength and conditioning program nonetheless. But what is a strength and conditioning program? Okay. Yes, we're getting you strong. Yes, we're getting you in better shape. We take it a step further and look at limiting factors. It's not what you can do, but it's what you can't do. Limiting factors are anything that come in the way of empowering your performance, and we have a hierarchy of them. The first of the hierarchy will be mobility and flexibility. Mobility and flexibility is the very first of our hierarchy of limiting factors. Mobility is the ability of your joints to get into a position. Flexibility is the ability of your soft tissues to be elastic enough to get into a position. So we are going to label this position. The next on our hierarchy of limiting factors will be stability. This is the ability of your body to maintain a certain posture and position through a full range of motion. So looking and getting into certain positions and then the ability to move throughout these positions so this is going to be posture. Maintaining posture and position. Our third on the hierarchy of limiting factors is going to be primal movements. We will hit the primal movements in more detail later in the lecture. But what you guys need to know now is that this is just movement. Okay? What can we do within our set scope of what we're doing? of sport. Primal movement patterns are going to be our third. The fourth is going to be the transfer of training.
is everything that we do in our strength and conditioning program directly transfer to their performance on the field? And is what we are doing empowering their performance? If they're not able to take what we do in the weight room directly to the field to increase performance, then we've failed. And our strength and conditioning program as a whole has let that athlete down. What we don't want to do is go further and say, you are the limiting factor. You as a coach, what you're doing for your athlete is limiting their performance on their field or in their sport. Do not be the limiting factor. You are here this weekend to gain all of this knowledge and go through all of this work so that this is not going to happen. We will work on all of these as well. But this right here is the culmination of everything in here that we look at for limiting factors. Now looking at conditioning, how long, you know, how in shape do you have to be in order to play sport? You only have to be as in shape to survive your training. So in the preseason, you have to be in shape enough to survive the workouts every day. And during the season, you have to be in enough shape to survive practice. When competition rolls around, you need to be in the best amount of shape to survive that competition. The only way for you to get into shape for your sport is by playing your sport. So all the things that we're going to do in our strength and conditioning portion is going to be above and beyond what we're looking at when we're actually on the field. We are not sport coaches. What we are trying to do is to develop the best athlete to transfer then onto the field to empower their performance there. Okay. The next thing that we're going to look at is how we do this with the barbell and the Olympic lifts. Now a lot of people would think that barbell and Olympic lifts are part of strength and conditioning. We hold them near and dear to our core because it is the cornerstone of what we do. When we look at barbell and Oli lifts, what we're looking at is the fastest way to drive a physiological and psychological adaptation. These movements are tools to challenge both posture and position through ranges of motion. Okay? The barbell and Olympic lifts that we use so far with the barbell will be back squat, strict press, bench, and deadlift. What we are doing there is building absolute strength. The ability for an athlete to produce as much force as possible through a range of motion. The barbell lifts are adaptations in strength. Not only are they adaptations, but we are going to use an accelerated adaptation. Accelerated adaptation is taking the small time that we have. What do we get? Six weeks, eight weeks, ten, maybe twenty in the preseason or in the offseason to develop athletes strength-wise. Accelerated adaptation means we are going to use these barbell lifts to push as much strength out of these kids in the shortest time as possible. Here's an example. Program number one from KC. There's a rapper called Tech 9 This will be called Tech 9 Chest Blaster. And what we're going to do is over eight weeks is we are going to give you 20 pounds addition to your bench. It's not bad. 20 pounds. I know a lot of people with PRs that haven't been raised in years would kill for 20 pounds. Okay? So we've got Pec 9, 20 pounds in a short amount of time. The next one that we're going to look at is the treasure chest. People go all over the world looking for the treasure chest, looking for that secret little Pec blaster that we are going to do to increase our bench by 100 pounds in eight weeks. Now, which one of these programs work? Was it the Pec 9? Or was it the treasure chest? Well, both of them actually did because both of them put on weight. You got 20 pounds from one, you got 100 pounds from another. But which one worked better? The treasure chest did because you got 100 pounds in a shorter amount of time. This right here is what we know as accelerated adaptation. We are wringing out every single ounce and pound that we can get out of this program as fast as we possibly can. Okay. After we look at barbell lifts, we are going to look at the Olympic lifts. First and foremost, we are not teaching or coaching Olympic lifters. Olympic lifting is a very technical, very detail-oriented skill and sport that we do not have the time to produce. What we are doing is showing that this strength is going to stand alone all by itself. 
if we cannot dynamically display it or use it. This is where the Olympic lifts come in. Dynamic displays of strength. We like the power variations versus the full variations. The full variations are way too technical to teach in a very short amount of time. And they focus more on getting under the bar rather than producing force by vertically moving that bar. When we use the power variations, the dynamic display of strength is put to the test. If you can deadlift seven, 800 pounds, but you can't power clean your body weight, you cannot dynamically express your strength, and therefore, it will not transfer directly to the field. When we look at strength on an island, again, it's all by itself. You can be as strong as you possibly can, but if you cannot use that strength on the field, then it's just left out there. So, back squatting, bench pressing, strict pressing, and deadlifting will not get you there. What you need is that stepping stone in between. So here we have the squat, and here we have the field. This is the power clean that will take you directly to and have a transfer of training from the weight room to the field. When we Olympic lift, we are vertically displacing our bodies. We are going through a violent hip extension. That's why we use the power method. When we come off the floor and get to a big triple extension, that is going to mimic a lot of what we see on the field. First and foremost, with the Olympics, it will transfer to sprinting. Can we move from here to a violent hip extension as fast as we can? The direct transfer of training will go to sprinting and making faster athletes. Let's look at collision sports. The ability to violently extend your hip will determine whether or not you really survive on the field in collision sports. Football, rugby, hockey. Can you deliver the blow and be the victor? Uh, it's an Olympic year. Let's talk about gymnastics. Gymnastics, USA, kicking ass, awesome. If I have to jump and flip twice in the air, and half twist and still land with enough room that I can stick the landing without bending over because I don't have the space, you better be damn sure I have a violent hip extension coming off of that floor to produce enough force to flip twice and twist once. Dynamic representation of the strength we have built in the weight room is through the Olympic lifts that we use. While this isn't the most efficient way to do it, to make someone faster, to increase their sprinting abilities, we find that the direct transfer is better off served as this chain that we looked earlier. Going from the barbell to the Olympic to the sprinting. What this is, is an example of the said principle. This is a specific adaptation to impose demands. We are demanding that they be strong with the barbell. We are making them dynamically represent that, and we are going to get better sprinters, better collision sport athletes, better gymnasts, because of the specific adaptation to impose demands that we have placed on them. Barbell and only. The last thing we're going to talk about in this little section is body awareness. How your body seamlessly and effortlessly move it, effortlessly, effortlessly moves through space. Think of kinesthetic awareness. The ability of your body to know where it is in space and to move seamlessly and effortlessly. When looking at the different planes of motion that we can work in and move in, we look at both the satchel and the transverse and the frontal planes. The first one being satchel. If I cut myself 
in half like this, and I ran a plane coming out towards infinity, any movements that I do that run parallel to this plane is happening in a sagittal plane of movement. So think anything in CrossFit, where that doorway is, anything that I can do, bilateral hip hinge, lunging, all of those. Okay? Sagittal, so where we see CrossFit, it's a strength and conditioning program. The next plane of motion will be transverse. The transverse plane. If I cut myself in half, put a big plane all the way through to infinity, anything that happens parallel to that plane of motion, that guy in a little coat, my favorite. Good. So we are going to think, Tommy boy. Whatever happens around this axis, any rotational movements that we're doing, that is occurring in the transverse plane. The last one, frontal. The frontal plane, if I ran straight across where this whiteboard is, through the front half of my body and the back half of my body, anything that occurs parallel to this plane would be in the frontal plane. So think of the Vitruvian man, think of jumping jacks, Think of lateral movements. Kinesthetic awareness is being able to seamlessly and effortlessly move through these planes of motion. So the frontal, think of the truth. And, and lateral movements. Being able to move seamlessly and effortlessly through those three planes of motion. Another ability of body awareness is to know your surroundings and obstacles. Being able to step over this kettlebell right here in between my feet. Think linebacker drills in football. Being able to look at where I'm going and move laterally over the bags and then bam, sprinting ahead to attack the dummy, my opponent, whatever it is. Knowing my surroundings and being able to get over obstacles to accomplish my task. Being aware of where my body is and having a good kinesthetic awareness. The last thing. Primal. Movement. Primal movement efficiency. This is where CrossFit football has revolutionized strength and conditioning as a whole. We've taken everything out there and boiled it down to its simplest form. Primal movements. We have upper extremity and lower extremity primal movements. The upper extremity will be vertical, push, vertical pull. being able to push upwards, being able to pull down. Vertical push, vertical pull. After that, we're gonna have a horizontal push and pull. Everyone's favorite bench. <clears throat> Everyone's least favorite rows. Being able to horizontally push and pull. These are our upper extremity primals. When we look at the lower extremity, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the three different axes that these are gonna work around. So I want you to draw this little diagram down here, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And I'm gonna pull out my handy dandy half hip right here. Here is half of your hip joint. And I'm gonna use this bar here to represent the axes of motion. So what we have here is your right hip, and the x-axis is gonna go straight through the side of it. And what I want you to think of is a hip hinge. So we have anterior and posterior translation of the hip. Think the squat. We go down, we come back up. The hip hinge along the x-axis. So the first will be x, and that would be the squat in any variation of the hip hinge. 
This is our y-axis, going straight up and down. And when that splits the hip, what the hip can do is it can rotate around it forward and backward. So imagine taking a lunge. As I step forward, my hip turns, and then it comes back. And then the opposite happens on the other side. So when that hip goes, this hip is going to go in the back. This is the y-axis, or the vertical axis, through the hip. Y. Lunge. The third is going to be Z. And this is where it gets a little bit twisted for some people. Because we have to think three-dimensionally. We have to look at the z-axis coming straight out from the board. Okay? And when this happens, we take the hip coming straight out, and we put it around just like this. And in order for it to rotate around, the iliac crest is going to have to go up, or the iliac crest is going to have to go down. When you step up, as your hip comes up, your iliac crest is going to have to rotate upwards in order to step. As you push, it's going to rotate back down. Z-axis, three-dimensional, step-ups. These primal movements combined represent every movement in sport, every movement in training. Some people are going to think, what about throwing? So, rotational aspects. All rotational aspects are is individual angular arcs of the upper body primals. So when we train overhead athletes, when we train throwing athletes, we are still going to work vertical push, vertical pull, horizontal push, and horizontal pull. This right here, the body awareness and the kinesthetic awareness, being able to move through the planes of motion, working on your surroundings and the obstacles, and having primal movement efficiency is what gives us the best tool to apply all of these things to the field. Controlled and effortless movement through space, up through here, being able to maneuver around obstacles in your surroundings, and your ability to instinctively recruit primal movement efficiency. The very last thing that we're going to talk about in what is CrossFit football is the very tip top of our pyramid, and this is going to be sport. The pinnacle, we are there. We have gone through our foundation of nutrition and recovery. We have gone through our strength and conditioning program, our barbell and Olympic lifts, and our body awareness, and we are now peaked out at the tip of the iceberg. This is sport, okay? Sport equals performance. Everything that we do in sport is going to be based on what the performance is in that activity, okay? We spend all the time creating the best athlete that we can, and we hand them off to their sport coach to go and perform. What happens? Yeah, they fuck it all up. Of course they do. They've got linemen running gassers or laps at the end of practice. Everything that we have tried to build is now being shit all over by our sport coaches. That's okay. All the stuff that contradicts all of the stuff that we have put up here is in the coach's aspect. This is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to take everything behind me, mold the best athlete that we can, and put him in the coach's hands. The purpose of all of this is three things. One. Did the athlete acquire the performance traits acquired or needed for the task at hand? So participation in sport, practice in sport, competition in sport. Were these performance traits and these abilities used by the athlete? Can they pull from these performance traits? Can they apply it directly to the field? And number three, can they be successful? Can they dominate their opponent? Can they win? Can they have peak performance and come out the victor? If the answer is no, then we've failed them completely. And everything else that's up here is just literally writing on a whiteboard. It's not the program. It's not the heart and soul of being the strength and conditioning coach. When we look at sport, I'm going to break this off right here. Right there. 1%. Just the tip. Just, just to see how it feels. We're going to look at the 1% at the very tip top of the pyramid. We're going to call this competition, okay? 99% practice, 
One percent. Comp. Holmes football play. Seven seconds. Seven seconds over four quarters, repeated over and over again. Comes out to about three minutes of participation. Three minutes. Okay. Eight to twelve weeks of preseason. Eight weeks of practice. No, not eight weeks. Let's say four weeks of practice before you get to your first game day. All of that peaks up to one teeny tiny three minute competition. It's crazy. Game time and competition is the true test of whether or not any of this has worked. So we have done all of this work for three minutes to be judged on. Whether or not all of this, all 20 weeks of what you've been doing, 20 plus weeks of what you've been doing, can be judged in three minutes. It's rough. That's why there's such turnaround in college programs. This right here is our wheelhouse. From here to here. Get another marker. You guys can see this. We have everything below this line. Our sport coaches have everything above this line. Where the two intersect, it's going to be on this side. It's going to be posture. Hard to write sideways, I'm sorry. And position. Can you maintain posture and position through everything that we have worked on? Can you maintain posture and position on the field? Can you put yourself in the most advantageous area, the advanta most advantageous space to make the play, to be the victor, to win? We put our athletes in the best position to step out onto the field, and the training provides them more and more opportunities to become a better athlete. When you look at being an athlete, Speed is king. No one ever said that athlete's too fast. Speed is the most easily leveraged factor on the field. The fastest person, more than likely, will always win. All speed is, is a combination of power through posture and position. Display of power through proper posture and position. Speed. The goal of any training system should be to develop speed and athleticism. We have a very unique take on athleticism. Combining our body awareness and combining all of the aspects of our pyramid, what we define athleticism as, Sorry for the pause. Athleticism is the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish known and novel tasks. Known tasks are training. We know exactly what we have to do when we come in, when we bench, when we squat, when we do certain conditioning drills. What we don't know is sport. Put them out on the field, what's going to happen? They have the paths that they need to run. They have the plays that they need to run. They know they, who they're defending, but they have no idea what's going to happen. The ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish known and novel tasks. That is CrossFit football. Thank you very much.